penicillin, nobody owned the rights to. So they weren't able to make money off of it. So how do drug companies decide they're going to make money? Okay, we, meaning drug companies, we each have to discover our own antibiotic. We have to come up with antibiotics different than penicillin, similar, but a little bit different. Penicillin is called a narrow spectrum. So they were looking for broad spectrum antibiotics, things like streptomycin and others that might be able to attack even more, more infections. And there was a race, as there was with COVID vaccines, to be the first to come to market with these so that you could patent them. In America, you got the longest patent of any country in the world, that time 17 years. Once you get that patent, you have the rights to exclusively sell that product at a price that you alone determine. And this is critical. We were in the 1950s and we are today in 2021, the only country on the planet that allows drug companies unfettered pricing power. We allow them to set whatever price they want. If the price is too high and nobody will buy it, fine, that's the market condition. But in every other country, there's some medical panel, there's a group of doctors, there's a government agency that tries to negotiate the price, not in the US. So it's always been the wild west when it comes to setting prices, unbridled capitalism, and at the same time, the longest patent and exclusive period. What it led to, companies were searching for antibiotics in soil, because if you go through soil, you sift through tons of soil, you'll find under a microscope that there will be some activity that shows a little bit of what looks like antibiotic activity. they are natural antibiotics in soil. So there was a question that you had to come over. Was it possible to patent a product of nature? If you found something that was in nature, could you go ahead and patent? And the law had always said you couldn't patent a product of nature. It belonged to nature. As a matter of fact, this was the period in the 50s when the polio vaccine was first being developed. And Jonas Salk, who was the American developer of the polio vaccine, uh, when asked by uh, Edward R. Murrow, a radio newsman famous at the day, who owns this vaccine? Do you, you own the rights? Does a drug company own the rights? He, had, he gave an answer that is one of the chapter titles of my book. It's called, Could You Patent the Sun? His point was, no, nobody owns the rights. This belongs to everybody. Uh, you can't patent something that's dealing with public health. So the rule was you couldn't patent something that came from nature, except the drug companies fought this. They went up on appeal. They went before the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled in a major ruling in the 1950s that if you found the item that existed in nature and you then process it through a lab, you process it so that it became a therapeutic product that you could distribute as a drug, you could own the patent rights to it. And that was a game changer for the drug industry. So now you had drug companies who were patenting their own antibiotics. And in addition, you had something what I call me too drugs. So some companies were looking for an antibiotic, but they weren't very good at finding it. So another company had spent two or three years developing their own. And then a drug company would take the competitor's antibiotic and change it a little bit uh, by, by sort of, you know, working inside the lab to move its chemical structure a bit. It was chemically very close to the competitor's drug. But once the FDA approved that as being a real drug, it opened the door to what I call so-called Me Too drugs. And we see those over decades in every field, whether it's mild tranquilizers, whether it's hormone replacement, um, whether it's drugs for, uh, for heart uh, pressure and hypertension, you'll find Me Too drugs become some of the most successful drugs they're knockoffs of the first drugs of their type. No better example of a Me Too drug than one put out by Pfizer in the late 1950s. Uh, the, there was a successful drug called Aramycin. It was a broad spectrum antibiotic and was marketed by a, a small company called Letterlay. Pfizer wanted its own antibiotic. So it took Letterlay's drug, Aramycin, and it manipulated it so that it was missing one oxygen atom, one atom, that's all. That made no difference whatsoever on the efficacy of that drug. It made no difference on how the drug was administered. But Pfizer was still able to go ahead and get a patent for its drug, teramycin. Now, you would think that Pfizer would have some trouble selling teramycin since it had no reason to say it was a better drug. But something happened with Pfizer's drug, teramycin, that also changed the modern drug industry. And that was the marketing of it. The person who came to Pfizer and said, by the way, I can make your drug, your Me Too drug, the number one selling antibiotic in America, was a guy called Arthur Sackler. Now, some of you may have heard that last name Sackler, and you're right if you have heard it, they are the family most often known for owning Purdue Pharma. 
which is the, the maker of the, the hit blockbuster opioid painkiller OxyContin that's the poster child at the center of the opioid uh, epidemic that's the most lethal prescription drug crisis in American history. And we'll talk about that after. But Arthur Sackler was the oldest of three brothers. Uh, they were the first generation of immigrant parents who arrived and were running convenience store in Brooklyn. They all became psychiatrists. They all became medical doctors. Um, Arthur Sackler had graduated from NYU School of Medicine. His two brothers tried to get into NYU School of Medicine, but there were quotas for Jewish students at that time. So Jews were only allowed a certain number of seats as were African-Americans and as were, so they had to go to Glasgow, Scotland to finish their medical careers. But Arthur Sackler was the oldest of the brothers and he had a clever idea in the 1950s. He bought a small firm that specialized in medical advertising called McAdams Agency in New York. And he decided he would revolutionize the way that drugs were marketed and promoted. Now, excuse me. You have to realize that drugs weren't marketed and promoted the way they are today. It's not the way that they're sold directly to us. You turn on the television, you see them. This was an antiquated business in the sense that since they had to convince doctors to write prescriptions, the company spent very little on marketing and promotion. They essentially made copies of the inserts of their drugs, um, those long little pamphlets that you'll end up getting with a drug, and they ran those as almost photocopies inside one-page ads or quarter-page ads in medical journals like the Journal of the American Medical Association. That was the extent of advertising, nothing else. Sackler came into Pfizer. And he said to Jack McKean, who was the uh, hard charging chairman of Pfizer, give me $10 million and see what I can do with teramycin. And, and the rest of the industry laughed at Sackler because they thought his ideas were, were brazen crazy. How could you apply Madison Avenue hard sell to drugs? You were selling to doctors. But McKean took a gamble on him and put all that money up. And here's what, uh, here's what Sackler did. And a lot of it will sound familiar to you because they're things that then became uh, the, the standard operating procedure procedure for drug companies uh, in this country and around the world. He developed what's called detail, at the time detail men, they were all men, but today they're called detail teams. They are the sales teams that go out from drug companies and visit doctors personally. They concentrate on the highest prescribing doctors. They try to convince doctors to write the prescriptions. They make the sales in person. And that increased the sales of teramycin by multiple fold. In addition, he was the one who came up with the idea of a so-called speakers bureau. Let's take some doctors and pay them a certain amount of money so that they will go out and speak to other doctors about our product. Let's do conferences. Let's say it's February, it's the middle of winter in New York and it's cold and snowy. We'll have a, a conference in Bermuda where it's nice and sunny and we'll fly all the doctors from New York and Connecticut and New Jersey down to Bermuda so they're able to talk about our product and encourage them to write prescriptions when they get back. Let's do four, uh, four uh, color ads, full page, multi ads inside of medical journals so they stand out. Let's spend the money on posters. Let's spend the money on promotional, what he called pharmaceutical swag, gifts that we give away that we can give to doctors and we can write. Let's even run ads inside things like National Geographic and Time Magazine that perforated edges along the edges that can be pulled out. And even though we aren't supposed to advertise to consumers, we can send those magazines free to doctors. Now, all of that would have been a big so what if it hadn't been for the fact that it worked. Teramycin became the number one selling antibiotic in America and the rest of the drug company started to follow what Arthur Sackler did. In 1962, Sackler was called before the Senate. As a matter of fact, uh, Estes Gafalfer, the crusading Tennessee senator who had investigated the mafia, was investigating the drug industry and was thinking that the patent period they had was too long. Maybe it should be more like some European countries and brought down to five years. And in addition, he was looking at misleading advertisements and Arthur Sackler was called before that group. Um, Sackler, his business partners, uh, one Wolfgang Froelich, uh, who I write about in the book, Bill Froelich, who he had secret ownerships with, Behind me, you'll see some writing on the wall. That's me trying to find the list of secret companies of the Sacklers and Froelich and um, a Spanish psychiatrist, Dr. Ibanez were running at the time. They had the head of the FDA's antibiotic division, the most important person in the regulation of the federal government's drug programs at the time, working for them on the side, editing journals that they produced that did only good reviews slanted reviews about the drugs that their clients had. And then they paid this man at the time a couple of hundred thousand dollars under the table, which was a fortune. When it all came public, it was a big scandal. He had to resign. 
They're called before the Senate. None of them show up except for Sackler, who dodges every question he's given. And the investigators looking into the whole part about advertising in Sackler, I came up with a freedom of information request that disclosed a, a file that had never been disclosed before that said there's a Sackler empire. And it talked about the extent to which they're involved at every stage of testing, how they had conflicts of interest, how they were promoting drugs that they secretly had an interest in, how they were advertising them at the same time through companies. And yet they emerged from those investigations unscathed. And, and what happens? Arthur Sackler goes on in 1960, not to shame, but he goes on to be picked by Hoffman LaRoche, who has a new product that they've turned out in a laboratory. Uh, it's, it's called Librium uh, for equilibrium. It's the first of a new class of drugs called benzodiazepines. And it's really Arthur Sackler who takes that drug, not only makes it the number one selling drug in America by 1963, but he understands something very interesting. He understands the hard sell to doctors. He tells Hoffman and Roche in emails that we now have and in documents that we know that doctors are unable to concentrate on every new drug coming out. There are 4,000 drugs in the market at this time. Today, there are 20,000 drugs. There are too many drugs, even if doctors specialize, to be able to do all the background research and follow all of the studies. So as a result, the detail teams that go off are more important than ever. The advertisements that take place are more important than ever. The marketing of the drug becomes more important. And what Sackler does with Librium is he markets it almost as what he calls a lifestyle drug, a drug that's the equivalent of a be happy pill. You can go ahead and take Librium, even if you don't really need it for a lot of different situations, because it will make you feel better about the way you approach life. And, you know, this is an interesting time because in 1960, there was the first lifestyle drug, if you want to consider that, approved by the FDA. It's, it's a serial drug. Uh, it's, an, it's the oral, anti, uh, oral uh, contraceptive, the, the birth control pill. The first time in Equinol, it's called, that a drug has ever been approved by the FDA. It was very controversial, not just for religious objections. The first time a drug had ever been approved for, for a choice women didn't have to be sick to take it. They didn't have to have a disease. They didn't have to want to cure something. They had to take the drug because they wanted to have control reproductive rights of when they wanted children. So that drug was approved in 1960 for Sackler and the people who were marketing drugs. That was a watershed moment because they said, ah, now we can have drugs that really are lifestyle drugs. You don't have to necessarily be sick to take them. So Librium was one of those drugs that he tried to use for that purpose. And in Sackler's view, he, he relied on experiments that the US Army had done at Walter Reed Hospital in, in the 1950s. They're called the executive monkey experiments. And I write about this in the book. The army had taken two monkeys and they did a series of experiments in which they strapped them into a contraption into these machines. Their heads are locked back. They can't move any part of their body except for their arms. And they, the army attaches these electrodes to the bottom of the feet of, of the pair of monkeys and they deliver electric zaps to them, sort of these shocks. Then they put next to one of the monkeys a lever. Then if that monkey learns to operate the lever, it stops the shocks to both of them. Now, monkeys are pretty sharp. They learn very quickly. That monkey learns quite quickly. If it operates the, the lever, it's going to stop the shock for not only that monkey, but for the monkey next door. It does that repeatedly. When those monkeys die, and the army repeats this experiment dozens and dozens of times, they did autopsies of the monkeys. The monkey that operated the lever, what the army called the so-called executive monkey, because it had to make the decisions to operate the lever, had ulcers, had problems of, uh, of liver dysfunction, liver early onset liver disease, had arteriosclerosis, had hardening of the arteries, all types of the illnesses you would see from stress and the management of that stress. The other monkey, the non-executive monkey, didn't have the ulcers and didn't have the arteriosclerosis and those same types of items. Time and time again, the autopsy showed the same. So Arthur Sackler and the medical marketeers in America decided, okay, this is how we're gonna sell benzodiazepines and mild tranquilizers. This is how we'll differentiate between men and women. In this very sexist advertisement world, we will say to doctors, and 95% of all doctors in America at the time were men, so this is an easier pitch. We're gonna say, if you're a man, you need to take the Librium because you're under the great stress of earning the salary. You're the breadwinner for the household. You need to show the world you're tough. You can never show any weakness. You have to go off every day and you're under all of that pressure. And therefore, Librium will make you a more effective worker and keep you from getting an ulcer. 
And then to women, we'll sell it to them because they're basically neurotic and hysterical. That's literally the marketing. There are advertisements later that are shocking in how they show and portray women and it will keep you calmer and that's a better way to be. Now, it works with Librium, but where does it really work on steroids, this marketing? With the next drug from Hoffman LaRoche that Arthur Sackler makes into the most successful drug in drug history at the time, a drug called Valium, which many of you may remember. It's from the same company that had Librium. They put it out three years later. It knocks Librium off the top charts and Arthur Sackler is able to make Valium the number one drug in America for 15 years. It becomes the biggest selling drug by far. And at a time when it, he manages to do two things. Really, if you think of the mild tranquilizers, they're developed and you think they should be uh, prescribed probably by psychiatrists. And, and he knew, and Sackler said to Hoffman LaRoche, if you have psychiatrists, which I am one, prescribe Valium and Librium, you won't get many prescriptions because there aren't enough of them. So you need to have general practitioners, the doctors that people go to see for their general health, just prescribing these like candy. And that's exactly what happened. Only 10% of the prescriptions over the 1960s written for Valium came from shrinks, 90% from general practitioners. And nearly two thirds of those prescriptions ended up not only targeting women, but they were for women. They were prescribed by doctors for women. They were ads that were run full page ads in medical journals that literally ended up showing, for instance, uh, there's a woman in which Arthur Sackler makes up a fictional 35 year old woman and she's shown in pictures over time, first with her father, and then she's shown with dating men. She's unable to find a happy man to marry. And at 35, she's a spinster and she's alone and she's neurotic. And what does she need to be better? Valium. There are ads that are run for Adderall at the time. Diet pills were very big in the 60s. Diet clinics opened up. It was the epidemic of the 60s in many ways, the same way that opioids later became the epidemic of the 90s and 2000s. Amphetamines and diet clinicians and diet clinics, more than 10,000 diet clinics opened up in the United States. Amphetamines being dispensed by doctors at a dizzying rate. And, and the advertisements for those in medical journals showed women vacuuming faster inside the house, doing housework faster so that it would make you better at what you should be doing inside the house if you were cleaning the house. It's remarkable when we look at them through the prism of just sexist ads. And two things are happening, by the way, when Sackler and the drug industry are promoting these drugs and making them the biggest selling drugs. I mentioned before the birth control pill, the Yes, it was revolutionary in terms of giving women the, the, the choice over reproductive rights. But Cyril was receiving reports inside the company from about 1965 and on that there were an increasing number of what looked like blood clots for women taking the uh, birth control pill, their particular model. And there were also women that looked like they were developing uterine cancer. What does Cyril do with those? You think they called up the FDA, called up a local reporter? No. They put them in the back room. They hid those reports. It wasn't until the mid 1970s that it came out by a time when hundreds of thousands of women had already had those adverse effects and some of them had died that that became known. That's one of the first major cases of what I call drug company putting out a successful product, learning about the bad results after it's out and then hiding those results, something that would happen time and time again. Another drug that was out during the period, my wife wrote a book about this called This Is Not Your Mother's Menopause about her passing through menopause without using hormone replacement because she has a history of breast cancer inside her family. Well, guess what? The original hormone replacement therapy that came out in the early 1960s from Wyeth, uh, Prempro, uh, pregnant you know, mare's urine is the basis for that, uh, became a wildly successful drug. Why? There's a gynecologist in New York called Robert Wilson. Robert Wilson wrote a book called Feminine Forever in which he says that his own mother when she went through menopause, became the equivalent of a, 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 a eunuch. They, uh, she had no sexual desire. Her hair thinned. Her skin shriveled up. She looked old. She lost her sexuality. And what replaced all of that? Hormone replacement therapy. Now, guess what? It turns out that Robert Wilson's book became a national bestseller, led a lot of women to decide that they actually wanted to use HRT. The book was underwritten by Wyeth, which we didn't know for decades later. His office in New York was underwritten by Wyeth. His own wife, as I disclosed in the book, came down with estrogen-based breast cancer twice. They didn't tell 
their own son about it because they thought it would be bad for marketing of the drug. It was only in the 1970s when Wyatt admitted they also had been receiving nearly a, a decade of reports of women developing uterine cancer, blood clots, and breast cancer from extremely high levels of the original levels of hormone replacement and had to then go ahead and reformulate it. And there's something that happens in this period. The federal government sets a schedule that a pattern that unfortunately becomes the way forward. And that is, what's the penalty for these companies? You've gone ahead and you've hidden the, the adverse effects that come in that can be life-threatening about your drugs. You haven't said anything, you've continued to sell them, you've made all this money, now you're caught red-handed. There are Senate investigations. You have no shame because you're worried about making the profits first. So what do you think they do? They charge some of these executives with crimes, with manslaughter, they send them to jail? No no criminal charges, they find them. They come to these big companies and they say, okay, you did the wrong thing. You may have even killed people. Now we're gonna give you a big fine. And the companies pay it. And guess what? It becomes the cost of doing business. That's exactly, they've made billions of dollars on the drugs. They've hidden the idea that benzodiazepines and, and Valium were addictive. Uh, people combining Valium together with liquor and other drugs could die because it reduces, slows your heart rate up. The, and when they finally get caught, they have to pay the amount. Vioxx, many of you may remember, one of the most successful drugs, anti-inflammatories for treating arthritis. Guess what? As those reports filtered into Pfizer that was causing heart attacks and they hid them, when that eventually became public, they do a massive recall. What happens? They pay a fine. So we read about these three, four, five billion dollar fines. And, and in the end, they don't hurt anything but the bottom line a little bit. 